Hi everybody, I'm Susan Mulvihill. Welcome back to my vegetable garden. Well, today you're going to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yep, I'm taking you on a late summer tour of our vegetable garden. We've had some great successes, a few failures, and some unusual problems. So we'll go over all of that stuff. Now, before we proceed, I would like to introduce myself. I live in Spokane, Washington, which is about 300 miles east of Seattle. We are in hardiness zone 5B. Most of Spokane is 6A, but we're in a microclimate, so that's why we have the lower zone. I write the Sunday garden columns for the newspaper here, the Spokesman Review, and you can always read them on my website. I have been a master gardener for over 20 years. I'm the author of the Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook and the new book coming out, which is the Vegetable Garden Problem Solver Handbook. That one comes out in February 2023. And I'm co-author of the Northwest Gardener's Handbook. Okay, let's get started on that tour. And it's very hot here still. Okay, let's start out with the leek bed and look at the flower heads on there. I'd like to say that's very pretty. It's not a good sign when leeks bolt to seed. And that is exactly what's going on. I'm attributing it to our exceptionally hot weather. It's been hot for quite a long time and I think they just can't handle it. They get watered regularly and so on. I keep telling myself I might as well just clip off those flower heads, but I'm pretty sure what's happened is that the center of each leek stalk is very woody. So I need to harvest one and check it out, but it's just really frustrating. This second bed is one that's covered with agricultural insect netting. I have talked about this on previous videos, including the very last one, which was about row covers. But this is a hinged raised bed cover, and it is a DIY project from my book, The Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook. And what I have growing in here these days is arugula, a bit of lettuce, and then a while back I started some cabbage seedlings. I also have some turnips growing in here and some radishes. This bed has had lettuce growing in it for quite a while. And when I pulled them out because it had just been too hot for them, I decided, you know, I'm gonna do a succession crop. And so cabbage is a good candidate for that. And the seedlings are coming along really nicely. This agricultural insect netting, as you might guess, is for keeping insects that are damaging ones away from the crops inside. Cabbage, turnips, radishes, lettuce, and arugula do not need to be pollinated, so I can just leave this on the whole time. And as I reported in my last video, this has worked great for us. In this next bed, Bill is growing a whole bunch of red onions. Last year, he came across a recipe for making pickled red onions. It's really simple and we became addicted to them because you can use them on all sorts of things. So he said, you know, I'm going to grow even more red onions this year. So the plants are doing great. You might notice down on the left, there are a few where the stalks have fallen over. That means those onions have finished growing. And so we can pick those at any time. This next bed has floating row cover over it. Let's see what's inside. I'm growing beets in this bed, both cylindra, which is the cylindrical dark beets, and golden beets. And I've been keeping them covered with floating row cover because I'm trying to keep leaf miner flies away from the leaves because the females will lay eggs, those hatch into little maggots, and those are what tunnel through the leaves. So that's why there has been floating row cover on the bed. I also have planted some turnip seeds and radish seeds, but they're not up yet. This next bed is a bit of a succession crop experiment on our parts. This is the bed where I was growing what we called our gutter peas. And those are ones that are started in rain gutters and then planted en masse into two trenches. And the peas did great, but you always think, okay, they're going to be done relatively early in the growing season, now what? So we decided to try a bed of corn. This is sweetness by color. The seeds came from Ed Hume seeds. 
and they take 68 days to reach maturity. We started them indoors on July 2nd, but the thing with days to maturity is the clock does not start running until you transplant seedlings out into the garden. So we did that on July 22nd, and we are crossing our fingers that we can pull this off. We typically get our first frost between middle September and the 1st of October. So we're rooting for a late frost, but they are doing really, really great. They're even starting to tassel. So fingers crossed, it's looking promising, and you'll get the update on that. This is the other covered raised bed lid. And you've seen this recently, but I wanted to show it to you today. So in this bed, I'm growing two types of beets, a few leftover leeks from the other bed, and they are not going to seed, so that's interesting. And then Swiss chard. I have been harvesting the Swiss chard regularly, and here we are with big leaves again, which is awesome. So all you do is you cut off the stalks and harvest them that way because the plants will continue to produce new leaves. So this bed is doing great and this cover is keeping the leaf miner away because beet family crops such as Swiss chard, beets, and spinach are all very susceptible to leaf miners. Okay, this is the second row of raised beds in our garden, and the first two beds are covered by this hoop house. This is something that Bill designed and built quite a few years ago, and this has worked really well for heat-loving crops during the summer months and cold-tolerant crops during the fall and winter months. It is not heated during the winter at all. So in here, we're growing peppers. And I should more specifically say that Bill is growing peppers because he is the pepper expert and this year's crop is looking fantastic. Bill has quite a variety of peppers growing in here. Two of the sweet peppers are Marconi Rosso and Dragonfly, which is a purple bell. And those are fantastic, but he's also got some hot peppers in here. And if I just stop here and zoom in, do you see those peppers? So those are Marconi Rosso. Those seeds also came from Ed Hume Seeds, and it is our most reliable sweet pepper that we enjoy growing. All right, the next bed is a tomato bed that is right outside of the hoop house. And in it, I'm growing Mortgage Lifter and Chef's Choice Orange, so both slicing tomatoes. This is my first year to grow Mortgage Lifter, and I've grown Chef's Choice Orange for several years. I love that tomato. But when I said we were going to see the good, the bad, and the ugly, this is either the bad or the ugly category. I can't decide which. Actually, the plants look really nice. They got through the heat spell that we had where we were well into the hundreds pretty well, courtesy of a shade cloth that we draped over the bed. That's what part of this stick is here for. And the problem is that here in Spokane, we had an exceptionally cold, wet spring. And that means the soil was cold. Now, I waited until almost June 1st to plant the tomatoes, thought we were going to be able to get away with it. And it turns out that folks who are growing tomatoes here in the inland northwest are all experiencing the same problem, which is either no tomatoes at all or very few tomatoes. And I'm in the latter category. It's so frustrating this year. But the other thing that happened that I was not expecting is that these tomato plants have been attacked by thrips. And a lot of times insect problems happen when plants are stressed. So here we started them off with this horrible cold wet spring and then it transitioned into an extremely hot summer. I would say these plants are definitely stressed. So it's frustrating for me. There are some tomatoes on here, 
and I'm going to talk more about thrips and other types of tomato problems in my next video. But I just wanted to explain that, yeah, there are tomatoes on here. I see some right here. They're like this big. <laughs> I'm hoping that at least the ones that I can see today will make it by the end of the growing season because Bill and I rely heavily on a big tomato crop so we can make tomato sauce and tomato salsa. Sometimes we even make ketchup. That's not going to happen this year. But it is exceedingly frustrating and I'll show you how the paste tomato beds are doing as well when we get to the third row. In the next bed, in the foreground, I'm growing top crop bush beans. Now last year they saved the day because it was so hot here that our pole beans, which have always been so reliable, basically shut down and they didn't want to produce any beans. And this year the top crop beans are doing so-so. Uh, it is a very good variety, but I think, again, the super cold spring and then transitioning right into a very hot summer have been a little bit stressful for them. I have been harvesting beans off of them, but not quite like what I was harvesting last year. So that's a little bit discouraging. Now on the right end of the bed, I've got some artichokes. So let's take a look at those. These two plants here are Tavor artichokes, and I've got three little artichokes on this plant and three on this plant, so that's exciting. Oh, I just found a fourth. Might be some others hiding in there. So these are doing really great. And if you're curious about these orange flowers, these are a zinnia called queen lime orange. They are doing great. And they are a fantastic plant for attracting pollinators. They're a great cut flower, and I just love them. And then these yellow flowers here are big duck yellow marigolds. And those have been so reliable. So I grow them in the garden every single year. If you're wondering what's happening in the next bed, this is known as a chicken wire crop coop. It came from Gardener's Supply. And Bill planted some carrot seeds in here. And we needed to keep the quail away. So he thought, yeah, this is a nice, easy way to quickly cover them until they get to be about three inches tall. And then they'll be OK. There's also shallots growing in the end of the bed that we're just harvesting slowly but surely. Here's the Monflor broccoli bed, and you can see we've got some shade cloth over it to try to protect it from the intensity of the sunlight and the heat. So let's take a peek underneath. And you'll notice there's another layer over the bed. That is the agricultural insect netting. It is the third and final bed that we're using that product on this year. It is to keep aphids and cabbage worms away from the broccoli plants. I had someone ask me a couple days ago if it has been successful keeping the aphids out. She has been using the tulle or bridal veil netting. And just like I found over the years, aphids can sneak through those holes. But they sure haven't on the broccoli bed with this agricultural insect netting in place. It has been 100% successful keeping damaging pests away from the plants. And cabbage family crops, which of course broccoli is a member of, are very susceptible to insects. I realize that it's pretty hard to see the broccoli plants underneath, but I wanted to let you know that they're doing well. We have harvested the primary heads off of them and gotten a few harvests of the secondary smaller heads. And Montflor is new to us this year. We have not grown it before. We're still deciding whether we like it as much as early dividend, which we normally have grown. So the jury's still out on that right now. But the plants are doing well pest free and producing well for us, even in this heat. And so I think that that shade cloth is really making a difference. You know, in a previous video where I talked about shade cloth, I mentioned how it's important to suspend it over a crop and allow for airflow if you can. That is the ideal. However, on this bed, we didn't really have an option other than to just drape it over the top of the bed. And it seems to be working okay, so 
we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. The last bed in this row is where we're growing some of our carrots. I've got three or four different varieties in the bed. There's also a little row of onions down the middle. Everything is doing really well, much better than last year. So I'm hoping for a very nice harvest. I also want to point out something at the end of the bed. This year we ended up with a volunteer sunflower. And I thought, do I keep it or do I get rid of it? And I thought, no, I'm going to keep it. And the main reason is for the pollinators that it attracts to the garden. You know, it is so important to add flowers to your vegetable garden because you will get much better pollination. So I just wanted to point that out. If you look closely, you can see all sorts of things buzzing about and it's great to have them in the garden. Now here's another nominee for the ugly category. <laughs> And that is an onion bed. You can see that the bulbs are quite small. And I think the main problem is that this bed gets a lot of shade on it for the first few hours each day because we have a pine tree that is directly behind me and behind me is to the east where the sun is coming up. We also have a hedge to the north of it that possibly is causing roots to be infiltrated in the soil. I didn't notice anything while preparing that bed earlier this year. It could also be that it's getting a little bit of shade from the grapevines and honeysuckle bushes that are growing here. But it's not a good example of how to grow your onions. So, you know, sometimes not everything works. And here's an example. Here is the famous pole bean arbor. I am growing rattlesnake pole beans and vortex pole beans on it this year. This is the first year I've grown either of those varieties. They seem to be doing pretty well, but I have to say my favorite at this point is the vortex. The rattlesnake has turned out to be eh, kind of hit or miss as far as production goes. And you know, a lot of times it's hard to troubleshoot and decide, okay, was that because of the cold, wet spring? I would think that the beans would tolerate that a little bit, maybe not so much the cold weather, but also this very hot summer. So I'll probably try them again just to give them another chance. We've been harvesting quite a bit, and then lately with the temperatures going up more, it seems like they're shutting down a little bit. So we'll see how it goes. I think I'm going to give them a little extra fertilizer. We're trying to water them a lot and hoping to get more of a crop before the end of the season. Right next door to the pole bean arbor is the cucurbit arbor. Now cucurbits are a family of crops that includes summer and winter squash, pumpkins and cucumbers, also melons. And so what I'm growing on here are winter squash and pumpkins. And you can see that this did not get filled in and I think a lot of it is attributable to our very hot summer. Now squash do like the heat, but I think it's been a bit too much for them. We've also been kind of playing with how much water to give the garden. We use a drip irrigation system and you know we try to really conserve water. Even though we're on a well, we feel it's our duty to be good about conserving it. And I think maybe we haven't given them quite as much water as they would have liked. But you can see I've got some pumpkins hanging here. Also down on this end of the arbor, I've got some winter squash. This is poti marone. You probably can't see this one, but that's another poti marone. I've got more pumpkins and winter squash down on the ground here. I've got some Australian butter squash and they're just sprawling all over the place, but it looks like we're going to get a decent harvest, but certainly not as much as in past years. And if you look at the plants, they do look like they're struggling. This is a little hard to see, but the two beds you're looking at are the other tomato beds. This is where we're growing paste tomatoes and the varieties are Federley and Gilberti. I've grown them for years and for years we've gotten a massive harvest from them. 
Now there are tomatoes on the plants, but again, it's going to be a fraction of what we would normally get. And I think the biggest problem was the cold, wet spring. Oh, this is so frustrating. Right next to one of the tomato beds is another contender for the ugly category. So in these five grow bags, there are potatoes growing. We have grown them before very successfully in grow bags. They get enough water and we did something that we think really set them back. And that is when we suspended the shade cloth from this point here all the way to the livestock panel to protect the tomatoes from the heat and sunlight. All of the foliage in these bags died. That was a huge surprise. And of course, we didn't notice that. We thought they would be fine. And so when we moved the cover off of the beds, this is what we were greeted with. Oh my. We're going to just leave them be. I do see a little bit of new foliage in a couple of the bags. Now, next to the carrot bed, which was in the second row of beds, that's where we have five more bags of potatoes growing, and those ones look fine. I mean, they look like they usually look this time of year. They look a little peaked, um, but they're still growing and there's still plenty of foliage. So we think that these should not have been covered by the shade cloth. Wow. Okay, this is the 16 foot long bed that we're growing three things in. We're growing Cocozelle zucchini, Goldilocks bush acorn plants, and a melon variety that always takes me a minute to pronounce. Malone Rotato Degli Ortolani. My apologies if that wasn't a great pronunciation, but I did the best I could. Now let me show you how the plants are doing up close. I do see a Cocozel zucchini that I had better pick, but this is a great variety. The zucchinis are tender and flavorful, and I definitely recommend it. Here are some of the Goldilocks bush acorn squash and they are very productive. We grew them last year for the first time. I'm very impressed with how productive they are. I love how they're on a bush rather than a vine. And these are so good when you roast them in the oven. It's tricky to point these out, but this is the cantaloupe bed. You can see this beautiful one here. Maybe you can also see the one over here. Yesterday, I counted 14 melons in this small area. So we are going to be eating some mighty fine, very sweet melons very soon. In the next bed, which is actually just eight feet long, I'm growing four more Goldilocks acorn squash plants, and they are being very productive and more sunflowers in the back because you can never have too many pollinators and too many flowers in the garden. This is our corn patch. It's sweetness by color, the same one that we are starting as a succession crop in the main area of the garden. This patch has been completely harvested. We had a very good crop this year, so that is certainly encouraging. I thought you'd get a kick out of this. So this is a small bed that is on the south side of our little greenhouse. And Bill decided to take it over. <laughs> he has planted a whole bunch of pepper plants that are growing beautifully. And then in the background there is a bunch of grape tomatoes. He's got a yellow variety and then a red variety, which is pandorino. I don't remember the variety of the yellow one. But look at those plants. They are going nuts. And the nice thing is that cherry tomatoes and grape tomatoes seem to be pretty forgiving. They are giving us a nice harvest, certainly not the bulk of what we would expect from our paste tomatoes, but hey, we'll take whatever we can get. And right next to the greenhouse bed is a small raised bed. And yes, Bill has even more peppers growing in there. Did I mention that we really like peppers? <laughs> Inside the greenhouse, yep, Bill's taken that over too because he's growing two big pots of sweet potatoes. 
The vines are going nuts in here and they seem to like the warm environment inside the greenhouse, so they're very happy. I thought I'd end on a nice cooling note because it is very hot in the garden now and I need to get inside. This is our pond that I just love and you can even see a pale yellow water lily blooming, which is nice. I believe that is Colorado. I hope you enjoyed the vegetable garden tour. Sometimes I think you're under the impression that I don't make any mistakes and that our garden is perfect every year. And so this month's tour was a perfect example of things that can go wrong. Some things are under our own control and some things we are at the mercy of. So we have a mix of them this year. I hope it was helpful to watch and I'll see you next week. Happy gardening.